Ambassador, thank you very much for the invitation to appear here today and discuss with this really wonderful group uh, perhaps something about the second Obama administration. You noted in your introductory comments that no one was exactly sure what the pivot to Asia means, and we aren't certain what the Obama administration might do in a second term. It's my hope that I can provide some insights into America's next four years. Even though I admittedly do not work for the administration, indeed this is probably a good thing so I can talk candidly and not worry about political correctness. Um, about a year ago, I received a phone call from a Mr. Les Gelb, who in America is the um, President Emeritus of the Council on Foreign Relations, asking me to participate in a study that the Peterson Foundation, also based in New York, was about to embark on in hopes that the Peterson Foundation could provide to the new U.S. administration about a year later some advice and counsel about how to manage America's military as part of our national security apparatus in an era following our long-term engagement in Iraq and Afghanistan in an era of fiscal monetary uh, constraints and in an era where our commitment to our allies could come into question. And so with that invitation, I joined a team in New York uh, to begin work on a recommended series uh, of uh, proposals for the new Obama administration or uh, whatever the administration would have been, we did not know at the time. So that's why I'm here today, to give you my perspective of this study that we did uh, that has been presented to high-level officials in the Obama administration, uh, all U.S. military high-level leaders, and many others in think tanks, universities, and academic circles in the United States. But we saved the best for last, because I'm coming here today to the best place in the world to have a discussion of national security. May I please have the next chart? So just quickly, the, uh, the study, this is what it looks like, and it's contained in an online site if you chose to get into the internet, you could download it from the internet, it was published physically by an organization called the Stimson Center in Washington, D.C., under the sponsorship of the Peterson Foundation, with the panel being organized by our Council on Foreign Relations. The reason I go through all those is to let you know that those organizations are viewed by our government as very important sounding boards for U.S. national and foreign policy. And consequently, these organizations are highly respected and highly regarded uh, for their recommended courses of action. The panel I sat on contained 15 at least 14 distinguished experts. I don't know if they would count me as a distinguished expert or not, but there were 15 members of the panel, and as I noted for you, these results have already been uh, briefed to most of the leaders in our government. May I have the next chart, please? So these were the uh, members of the team. Uh, just to, I don't want you to try to read that now. It's all in English, but the point is it has uh, senior military members, two former vice chairmans of the American Joint Chiefs of Staff, highly regarded, uh, uh, several important ambassadors, 
um, and other uh, key members of security uh, teams in the United States. And then, of course, I had the honor of being a part of the team as the former commander here in Korea. Let me have the next chart, please. Thank you. So here was our approach in trying to uh, lay out for the American government uh, how it needed to look at the world in its second administration uh, now that President Obama has been reelected. The first thing we wanted to do was clearly define what our vital national interests are so that our leaders in our government would know what we believed was worth fighting for. These national interests, as we refer to them, that are vital to America's security are the kinds of things that you would expect America to go to war over, to shed our blood and uh, fight for our country. So we wanted to articulate those very clearly so that we would understand um, perhaps if we go to war again, where that might be. We also wanted to develop a strategy to defend those interests, to ensure through strength that we would not have to fight to secure those interests. And then we got into the hard, we call it nuts and bolts, of the reality of the cost of the American defense establishment and how that impacts us today and in the future. And we made some proposals for how the military should be organized if our country adopts one of several different budgetary approaches. So that was our general method for this study. I think the key points are what's worth fighting for? What could you expect America to go to war over? Next chart, please. So we articulated for our government three key um, vital national security interests that we believe the United States would go to war over should they uh, be, should it be required to defend those interests. First and foremost, protecting the U.S. homeland from foreign enemies. And of course, the complexity is to define what is a foreign enemy that is likely to attack the United States and what form, what form would that attack perhaps take? And we did, laid out a couple of issues. First, our nation is threatened by a potential nuclear attack, most likely from North Korea or Iran. A lesser threat, of course, because they have nuclear weapons uh, and they are not allied directly with us from Russia and China. But we wanted to make it very clear for our government's use that it was essential to defend ourselves against a potential nuclear strike from North Korea or Iran. That does not necessarily mean a missile defense system. That means that we would have plans in place to prevent uh, those missiles uh, from being launched and if they were launched, to stop them in flight. And of course, with this on paper, the impact of our concern over North Korea's nuclear capability is very clear to those of you here in the Republic of Korea. Our second, and, and this then, is worth going to war over uh, should we be required to. Next, terrorists armed with unconventional weapons remain a clear and present danger to the United States of America. I don't have to tell this wonderful group um, how war feels 
But in 2001, we felt it again on our home shores. And we are pledged to continue to fight international jihadist terrorism to prevent them from attacking our country again. We are at war now against international jihadist terrorism. And I think that you know we strike terrorists wherever they are on the globe within our capabilities to prevent them from attacking our homeland. We look at their capabilities generally as unconventional, whether it be an airplane flying into a building like 2001 or a dirty bomb hand carried or perhaps in an over, overseas shipment container or a chemical weapon or a biological weapon, these would be the types of capabilities that jihadist terrorist cells could use in our homeland. And so we will remain at war with international terrorism until that threat is eliminated and our shores are secure. And when I say we will remain at war with international terrorists, that does not necessarily mean that we will remain at war in Afghanistan. My point is that we will and should attack terrorists who wish to do us harm wherever they are, whenever we can find them, and in whatever capacity we need to use to attack them. We are at war with international terrorists now. And I think very importantly, and a major change for our nation, is to recognize that cybersecurity is a vital national interest for the United States of America. Uh, our entire economic apparatus, your economic apparatus, depends on cyber uh, electronics to function. And as we know, nations around the world um, are preparing both offensive cyber weapons and defensive cyber weapons. The United States recognizes that we are vulnerable both militarily and within our civilian economic apparatus to cyber attack. We believe that defending America from cyber attack that could damage our military or damage our economy is a vital interest for America and could be worth going to war for. The only trouble is defining war. If we are attacked with a cyber attack and we counterattack, is that a benign war without actual troops fighting one another? Uh, and these are very interesting issues within the uh, classification of future warfare. But let there be no doubt that the United States cannot tolerate our, ec our economy being shut down because of an offensive attack by another nation or a rogue state. And we recommend that it is worth going to war over should our nation be attacked in a dangerous and meaningful way. These are our three uh, subcategories of protecting our homeland from foreign enemies. Next chart, please. Continuing with vital interests, and this is where the Republic of Korea is so important. We believe it's a vital national interest and worth going to war for defending our allies from attack. Allied in this case means those countries that we are in formal alliance arrangements with, signed treaties, wherein we've made a commitment to our allies to assist them in their defense should they be attacked. <clears throat> our study makes a list of all of those treaties and the countries with which we have made uh, a commitment to help them defend themselves from attack. 
Those include our NATO partners, formal alliance. It includes Australia, Japan, New Zealand, the Philippines, formal written alliances. And I just separated to point out for emphasis the Republic of Korea. This being the 60th year, uh, celebrate the alliance that we have together. Uh, we wanted to highlight that we will stand by our Republic of Korea friends should they be, should they be attacked, and that that equals a vital national interest for the United States, and that is worth going to war over. We also recognize that there were at least two countries that while we do not have signed treaties with them, we do not have treaties with two countries, they are very important to us, and we wanted to single them out as worth going to war over. Israel and Saudi Arabia. Why do I mention these two? One, the United States has a historical commitment to Israel coming out of World War II, ensuring that the uh, Jewish people had a homeland and rescuing them from the tyranny of Nazi murderers during World War II. And while we do not have a signed treaty with Israel, we are committed to assisting them in their defense should they be attacked. Likewise, we feel that Saudi Arabia remains a very important economic partner for the United States. Now, this is worth discussing a bit because Saudi Arabia is the world's leader for oil production um, and uh, is the leader of OPEC. And petroleum products remain the fundamental glue that makes international economies work. We recognize that if international jihadist terrorists or other countries were to take over Saudi Arabia, that the world supply of oil from the Middle East would be disrupted. And this is something that the United States uh, views as a vital interest to ensure the movement of petroleum products around the world is not disrupted. And so we have made a commitment to Saudi Arabia to assist them in defeating terrorists or a nation that might attack them, even though we do not have a signed treaty, obviously, with Saudi Arabia. So our treaty partners, NATO, Australia, Japan, New Zealand, the Philippines, our great friends, the Republic of Korea, 60 years, and we, will, we are committed to helping defend Israel and Saudi Arabia. I brought out a quote from our study that all 15 members agreed was a very important aspect. That quote is, the most salient threat today to our allies is posed by North Korea to South Korea. We believe this is the greatest risk of war today. And while the other aspects are important, the country most threatened is the Republic of Korea. And so we felt it important to write that in this study to highlight to the American government administration which one of our allies we believed needed the most commitment and reassurance, and that is the Republic of Korea. And you can find this quote in this study uh, should you desire to find it. May I have the next chart, please? And our last third vital interest is entitled ensuring, our, uh, ensuring unimpeded access to the global commons. The global commons are those areas where all countries should have freedom of access and not be held hostage by any other nation. 
We define for our government the global commons as international seaways. Now, this doesn't mean the seas that belong to countries, but it means international seas so we can have freedom of navigation around the world. We also define the seabed below the international seas as part of the global commons. Now, certainly, if a nation uh, out to their international um, line uh, of control of their own oceans, they would control their own seabed. But in international waters, in international waters, we believe those seabeds should be classified as global commons and should not be claimed by any nation but should be used by all nations for the betterment of the world. So if the United States has um, international water boundaries, we believe the seabed below those boundaries belong to us. But outside those boundaries, we believe those are part of the international commons. The problem is, of course, when you have disputed international seas that means you also have disputed seabeds. And these are very difficult issues for our diplomats, your diplomats, and our nations collectively to resolve. But nonetheless, we felt it was crucial to highlight that we believe it is vital that access to the seabeds uh, remains um, a, a vital interest for the United States. We defined outer space as global commons, and of course it is. And this means that nations should be free to use outer space for their own benefit and that no one could claim part of, of outer space as their own property. And that uh, the close space, um, low earth orbit areas, should remain part of the global commons. And of course, this is always an area of great interest because there are so many satellites in orbit that uh, we get into situations where there's conflicts between satellites in space. Furthermore, uh, we believe that the capability to conduct reconnaissance uh, from outer space uh, should be viewed as global commons. Consequently, no nation could claim the outer space above its borders. And of course, this gets into the issue of anti-space missiles uh, and defending our satellites from attack wherever our satellites might be, not just over the United States, but throughout the outer space global commons. And last, we have defined cyberspace as part of the global commons. No one has a right to attack cyberspace. Um, and we believe that that global commons should have unimpeded access. So global commons, unimpeded access, freedom of the seas, of the seabeds, outer space, and cyberspace formed an area of interest wherein the United States might be required to go to war. Okay, that's a description of the vital national interests as we discuss them in this report and as we have provided them uh, to government officials in the United States. Next chart, please. We also recognized and articulated in the report what we refer to as conditional interests. By conditional, we mean that we might go to war if the conditions associated with that interest area demanded it, but that we would make a choice. And I will just highlight quickly what those conditional interests are. 
we first discussed intervening in intrastate conflicts. Um, we define these as conflicts as ongoing civil wars. For example, Somalia, Syria, um, in the old days, Lebanon, etc. that the United States would only intervene in a nation's ongoing civil war under certain conditions. We did not view ongoing civil wars as a vital national interest, but a conditional interest. And then perhaps looking at uh, the concept of being present in a country such as Iraq or Afghanistan in an effort to stabilize governments to avoid the emergence of new threats, we articulated that these in the future should be conditionally based and that um, going uh, to war in places like Afghanistan and Iraq would be limited to very precise conditions. We were trying to inform the administration that while counterterrorism is vital to the United States, counterinsurgency in nations with long-standing standing ground wars would not be a vital interest. Deciding when you transition from a terrorist problem like Afghanistan to what amounted to an internal insurgency needs to be better articulated by our government because it often means that we stay embroiled in these conflicts way too long. These are conditional interests and these are not vital interests. Next chart, please. Then we took a look at America's strengths and um, some of our challenges, if you will, weaknesses. And uh, this means this is our view of how we see our national security apparatus today. We see us as having overwhelming military superiority in air, sea, space, and special operations areas. We know that our Air Force, our Navy, our capacity in the global commons of outer space, and our special operating forces, which are so important in counterterrorism, we believe are the best in the world, and it is a strength that we have <clears throat> and we wanted our government to be aware that um, this could be very important to maintain that strength. In an era of post-war in Iraq and Afghanistan, and an era of very difficult financial um, times. <clears throat> but we also said we had limitations. And that the war in Afghanistan reminds us of some of the limitations that we have on the ground. Those limitations involve defeating insurgencies. Uh, we saw that difficulty in Vietnam. We've seen it in Afghanistan. We've seen it in Iraq. <clears throat> to defeat insurgencies, stabilize governments, and ensure security for societies and distant lands, our capacity as a nation to do that is limited, and we should recognize that. This should be, we say, counsel. It should be counsel for our government that before we go off to become involved in an internal insurgency in a country, we should ensure that the conditions are important to America. <clears throat> we recognize that insurgencies are very difficult to defeat. And a nation like the United States must be very careful 
in deciding to become involved in the internal insurgency of any nation around the world. <coughs> Excuse me. So we articulated this. I think it's important also to point out that in the report, we showed the government, reminded them, that if this amount of dollars is being spent on military activities in the world, the dark blue right here along this line represents the current levels of expenditures by the United States. And this light blue area is the rest of the world combined. And so you can see over the years, the United States has spent a great amount of money, a lot of our treasure, on maintaining a very good defense. And I raise this point in this form because many Americans believe that this number should drop significantly. <clears throat> of course, if you drop that number significantly, you could lose this capability to maintain superiority in some of these important military areas. But the discussions on the panel questioned other countries' willingness to foot the bill for their own defense. This is the point where I raised my hand and reminded the panel that the Republic of Korea was one of very few countries that helped substantially defer cost for stationing American troops in your land. Last year alone, nearly $800 million uh, was paid to our treasury by your nation to defer a large amount of the operational cost to have our military here. So I reminded them while the United States spends a great deal of money on our military. There are some good friends of ours who help us, and that one of those good friends is the Republic of Korea. Next chart, please. We then laid out 10 operating principles, how America should operate in the next four years and beyond in what is now going to be the Obama administration. If you accept the vital and conditional national interests, then the strategy to defend those interests would best be served by 10 operating principles. And I will go over them briefly. One operating principle is to our own military. It says to our young soldiers, you fought hard for 10 years, we will not abandon you, and we will take care of you financially. We will take care of your medical expenses, and we will ensure that your service to your nation is an important part of our government's focus. So we're going to take care of our own and ensure that their service is recognized after many years of hard battle. Second, we also proposed... <clears throat> that there are a wide range of long-standing proposals to use the personnel we have in our military more effectively. Um, all countries, including the Republic of Korea, are always looking at your um, military to better use your manpower. And we are doing the same thing. Third, we're going to maintain space, air, and naval forces superior to any other country. This gives us power projection so that if we have to come to an allies aid, we can get there quickly and uh, effectively. Fourth, we're going to maintain a robust and technologically advanced special operations capability. We have to do that to continue the war against jihadist terrorists. Next chart. Fifth, we're going to put research and development money into long-range efforts to change the scope of warfare in the future. And we are going to, number six, 
continue to exercise global leadership by working cooperatively with our allies and meeting our obligations. And I just made another quote that was taken from the report, again, thanking the Republic of Korea for contributing monetarily to the stationing of our troops here. And we recognized that while we want a strong Air Force, a strong Navy, and strong special operations, we must be prepared to intervene on the ground with ground troops should that be required in assisting our allies. Next chart. We agree with the current policy to shift from troops stationed in foreign countries to rotational forces, where we rotate forces from the United States into places. However, we reminded everyone that permanently stationed troops in Korea are vital to our national interests. And so we should not go to a rotational presence in Korea. We should retain our permanent assignment of troops here in, in, the, in support of our alliance. So I extracted from the report, given the threat of war on the Korean Peninsula and the uncertain future, the U.S. should maintain currently planned ground and air combat units in Japan and Korea. And we believe that the American administration recognizes this and will remain committed to our troop levels here in the Republic of Korea. Next chart. And the last three operating principles, we are going to resist being drawn into long protracted ground wars, particularly of the counterinsurgency variety. And we are going to reduce the size of our nuclear force. It is larger than it is needed for our uh, capabilities, while fully recognizing uh, the requirement to maintain the nuclear umbrella for our allies, particularly the Republic of Korea. And last, we have cautioned about continuing to build in the United States missile defense systems. We believe that to stop rogue nations like North Korea and Iran, that we need to be forward. And we have forward anti-missile capability that we have a lot of confidence in right now. So we've, we believe we should defer a lot of the apparatus that we would build in our homeland. So those are the 10 operating principles, and I believe they effectively address uh, our requirement to our Korean ally. Next chart. I won't go over this chart. I will just tell you we spent quite a bit of time talking about how our military can become more efficient. And we are argued that if we become more efficient without hurting our capability, we could save upwards of a trillion dollars over the next 10 years. I don't think this is uh, too important for this group, but it's really important back in the United States where we have so many fiscal challenges right now. Next chart, please. We also provided some military structure assuming one of four budget paths that the United States might choose. Uh, you've heard a lot about uh, the sequester in the United States, perhaps, where uh, we will quickly lower military expenditures. And we argued against that and then laid out forces against all the reasonable approaches to monetary expenditures for defense. I won't go into any of those, but uh, I believe we gave our administration very useful information how to organize the military given any one of four different fiscal scenarios. Next chart. I won't discuss this one either. These are internal matters uh, given those previous fiscal constraints where we would emphasize expenditures and where we could take some risk. 
And next chart, please. My last chart. Here was the bottom line of our report as it refers to the Republic of Korea. First, we recognize that the United States highly values the alliance with the Republic of Korea. We will remain committed to that alliance, and we will go to war to assist our Korean ally in defending itself. It is a vital national interest. We should maintain our current forces here as long as we are welcome and wanted. And so you should not worry about America pulling troops out of the, of, of, from the Korean Peninsula. And we articulated once more that North Korean missile capability is a threat against which the United States must prepare to ensure that no North Korean missile is ever launched to hurt us or our allies, particularly the Republic of Korea. In closing, um, this report called the uh, Stimson Report has been uh, widely distributed in the United States. I believe that you will see when the Obama administration publishes our next national security strategy, which will be in the next year, that the basis for that strategy is most likely to come from this publication. Uh, and that uh, the things I discussed with you today are highly probable to be, uh, uh, to be accepted by the United States government as a proper and appropriate method of operating over the next four years. So Ambassador, that's the uh, quick lay down of the contents of this study, and I will be honored to sit down and have questions or discussion.